I know I've, I've said this a few times, but I want to continue to say it and just let you know my absolute thanks and appreciation and just the gratitude I have towards this body of people. You've been so supportive over this past year. I cannot believe how quickly the year went. I feel like it was yesterday that Pat explained kind of like the transition plan with me coming on as an interim designate lead pastor and some of the breakdown of that, and now here we are. Uh, a year later, and we're doing the full installation and moving forward, and I just really want to extend uh, my thanks to you, because I really have felt the, the love and um, just the safety of being in God's house, and for allowing me to step into this role and to step into what God was saying, so I just sincerely uh, extend that gratitude to you. You're a beautiful, amazing group of people, and I know that we're going awesome places together. Uh, and I'm looking forward to tonight. I'm, uh, I'm so thankful that I decided to dress a little spiffy for you today. Yeah, it's my appreciation for you guys. <laughs> Actually, my wife picked out my clothes, so I had to. <laughs> Thanks, babe. All right. So, and thank you for all those who are able to make it out tonight as well. Um, uh, wow, I... I felt um, this Sunday that I, we needed to go over again what we talked about uh, last Sunday. I uh, wasn't planning on it being a part one and part two, but uh, just really felt like the Lord impressed it on my heart that there was more that needed to be said, more that needed to just press itself into our minds and hearts, and uh, it was just burning on my heart all week, just felt like it was what he was speaking, and... Um, uh, as a side note to that, I, I, I just want to say that if you've been coming here over this past year and you've been listening to the messages and getting to know me, uh, I'm sure you've heard me say that uh, a few times, that I felt like God spoke this or spoke this message or spoke that during the week. And uh, as I'm coming into my own, I guess, in preaching and, and figuring out how uh, how I want to maneuver through Sundays and how we want to present the Word of God here, I'm just finding more and more that God is just showing me, helping me to be myself and to just go week by week and really listen to His heart, you know, to just listen and hear what He has to say. And not that there's anything wrong with, uh, with strategizing um, whole sermon themes and topics and there'll be times and moments for that, um, but I just really feel as though God wants uh, me, at least, to operate on a, on a, 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 I guess I'll call it a revelatory basis, where you're just, you're, you're listening and, and receiving um, revelation. And um, I just thank you for, for working with me in that and being willing to hear and, and being willing to test it, because um, just because somebody says the Lord spoke something to them doesn't mean that it was the Lord, Okay. <laughs> Really, we need, to be, we need to use our minds and we need to really think and really pray and really ask God to confirm things to us when somebody says, I got a word from God. Um, I, I, my Christian journey got very twisted and I got a lot of legalism and burden put on me when I started listening to people who would say, thus says the Lord, and uh, certain people. Um, and so uh, I, I say this very tentatively, as I've said before, that, that even as I share, like, okay, this is what God is saying, um, I, 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 it, it might not be fully the Lord. Wow, imagine that. <laughs> I know that, 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 that might cause some insecurity because you want to come and know that you're hearing God and stuff, but, but we need to come up to a new place of maturity as a bride of Jesus, as a church. We need to come up to a place of of really wrestling through the word of God ourselves and really chewing on it ourselves and not just being spoon-fed, you know, what a pastor tells you. Um, I will make it very clear if I believe it is the Lord, like if he has spoken something and, and I'm just so firm on it and I need to, to do it because it's a fire in my bones kind of thing, Jeremiah. However, I, I really want you to keep that in your heart, that you would just, that you would listen, that you would co-listen with the Lord Jesus and with the, the Bible and, 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 and just in your own prayer life. And um, yeah, I just wanted to put that out there. Um, I totally respect and I bless pastors and churches that, um, 
that don't operate in that way and maybe operate more by a program and more by a schedule. You know, there's such a self-righteousness that can creep into prophetic churches and churches that are open to revelation where it's like, oh, those churches over there, they don't, they don't know the rhema word of God. Like, they don't, they don't have it. And there's such a, a cockiness that we need to just totally just strip, our, strip away from ourselves, okay? I don't want to see any elitism in this house. That we would, even, even being called a forerunner church, ooh, we're forerunners for Jesus. Well, guess what he said? The last shall be first. If you want to be a forerunner, let's go wash the feet of other pastors and other churches, right? Let, let's, let's honor and bless uh, other people around us. Let's lift them up. And, uh, and, and that will make us a true forerunner church. Because we are, and God has spoken that to this church over the years. We are to be forerunners. We are to carry revelation from his heart. But that should never lead into an elitism. You know what I mean by that? Is that making sense? So I just wanted to share that as, I'm, as we're moving forward this year and as I share week by week, you know, what I feel the Lord is saying. And when I say that too, I want you to know that you are all hearing God during the week. It's just a matter of how you tune in. He is always speaking. He really is. He is always speaking. Um, I'm so thankful to certain ministries in the body of Christ, a couple that, that was connected here for years, Stephen Chris Kynan, uh, who taught me a lot on the prophetic and other, other ministers in the body of Christ who taught me about hearing the voice of the Lord. And the main thing you learn from these, these prophets, these prophetic people, is that they're nothing special. They just learn to tune in. <laughs> they just learn to listen. God is always speaking through coincidental stuff in your life. He'll speak to you through movies and music. He'll do that. He'll speak to you through parables. He spoke in parables when he was alive on the earth here in physical form. And he'll speak to you when he's alive in heaven right now through parables now. <laughs> through song and music. And he'll speak to you just visions in your heart. Things that come to your mind randomly and you just test it and be like, Lord, what was that? And that's what happened this week, okay? I was, I was really feeling like something was in my heart. You know, this, this uh, intuition, whatever you want to call it, um, that we all get. But I was just tuning in, this intuition, there's something about Matthew 13. There's something still there. I can't leave it. I'm getting ready to prepare something else, but something's pulling me. So I'm like, all right, Lord, what is that about? And as I'm praying, I'm getting this happy gospel thing, this campaign in my heart as well. They're both kind of sitting there, these feelings. It's just these thoughts that rise up a little bit above the rest. And, um, and I'm like, okay, Lord, you know, just show me what you're saying. So I just devoted some time to, to hear from God and just listen. I had my laptop right here. I had my Bible and I had this book. And I'm like, all right, Lord, I want to prepare the message. Like, what are you saying? And so I just opened this book and I go to the end, actually. I never read the actual, like, you know, the pages where the, the, the publisher puts their stuff in there. You know what I'm talking about? Um, so the last page or the second to last page, both on the publisher end, th there's this little note from the publisher that I saw, and it says at the top, it says, in the right hands, this book will change lives. Most of the people who need this message, though, will not be looking for this book. <laughs> to change their lives, you need to put a copy of this book in their hands. And it's an encouragement to sow this book into other people. Um, and so then it quotes a scripture, and guess what scripture it quotes? Yeah, good one. Yeah, <laughs> you're prophetic. All right. <laughs> but other seed, it says, other seed fell into good ground. And that seed brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Fruitfulness. So I was like, okay, Lord, I know you want me to go into this. I know I can trust my heart here. Let's, let's dive into this. And so that's what I want to present this morning and unpack this. I also felt like the Lord said I wasn't strong enough last week as well, that there were some, some strong words he wanted to say that perhaps in my gentleness and grace orientation I wasn't willing to express fully. So we'll see if I can do that this Sunday. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. So, um, Matthew 13, to recap, right? It's the parable of the four soils. Jesus talks about four different types of people who will hear the gospel, who will receive the word in some way, in some form. He talks about people who get the seed on, uh, on the road, on the side of the road, and the birds of the sky come and steal it away. And he says that's the person who hears the word but really doesn't understand it, and the enemy comes and just snatches the word away, and it bears no fruit at all. And then there's the person that, that receives the word in the rocky places. And so it springs up, the fruitfulness springs up really quick, but then it withers and dies. And the Lord says those are the people that receive the word with joy and excitement. But then affliction comes, difficulty comes, some doubts come with the word, and they fall away. 
right? They fall away from the word. I don't think this is a parable about losing your salvation or not. We, I know we interpret it like that, but this is a parable about fruitfulness in your life, okay? It's about how much fruit you're bearing in your life, okay? So I just want to put that fear-based mentality off of you as we unpack this. Uh, the third person, it says, is falls among thorns, right? The thorns come and they choke it. And Jesus says those thorns are the people that are the things that crowd people that hear the message, but yet cares and worries, busyness of life and the deceitfulness of riches, okay? The worry and the deceitfulness of, of finances and riches comes and just chokes it. And it's not allowed to flourish. The seed's still there, but it doesn't flourish. And then finally, what I just read from this last part of the Happy Gospel book, then some seed fell on good soil. And those are people who hear and understand the word of the kingdom. And they produce a hundredfold, sixtyfold fruit in their life. This year, I want you to bear a hundredfold fruit. I want this to be a year of a hundredfold fruit in your life. That is the Lord's desire for you. Jesus, help us right now. That, that is the Lord God's desire for you, is that you would be fruitful. That you would bear fruit in your life. It really is. He wants you to bear fruit. He wants you to be fruitful. He really does. That's his heart, especially for this year in a corporate sense. But it's true for you individually. He wants you to bear fruit. And what is that fruitfulness, right? It, we can unpack all of that. But to summarize it, I mean, first of all, number one, it's inward reality of who we are. It's the fruit of righteousness. What freedom there is when you can... You can go into a situation that used to cause fear or used to cause anxiety or used to make you angry and all of a sudden you have peace and you have victory over that situation because you're walking in the peace of Christ. Do you know how amazing that is? It's amazing when you can actually love your enemy, love people that really deserve the opposite. I'm telling you there is nothing more intoxicating than loving your enemies and naturally, like really, like when you really, God, God had to work some of that in me a couple years ago and I'm telling you, when you can love your enemy and you can forgive, whew, it's a whole other realm, I'm telling you, when you can love supernaturally. So it's, it's inward fruit. It's fruit of freedom. It's fruit of joy. I mean, supernatural joy that you can be happy. <laughs> we try to spiritualize, oh, no, it's just the joy of the Lord. You know, it's not happiness. It's, it's the joy of the Lord, okay? It's happiness, okay? Sorry to break it to you. Um, but it's rejoicing means be happy, okay? Your joy looks like something. Okay, love looks like something, right? Love should look like something. It should, right? It's not just this nice theology. It's you, you should love looks like serving and, and giving yourself and all that kind of stuff. Well, joy looks like something. <laughs> joy looks like something. It looks like happiness. So the fruit of joy, okay? But also, too, beyond the inward reality is the outward things that come from that. So really, a prosperity comes upon us. The favor of the Lord comes upon us. We find favor in our jobs, and in our families, our relationships become fruitful. There's a health that's restored to our relationships. There's a peace in our relationships. There's a love. There's more of, a, a, more of the kingdom in our relationships. And there is financial blessing. There is. I know that's get, it gets tainted in the church, and we're all afraid to talk about that end of prosperity, but it's true because God wants to bless his church that we would be a blessing to others. He does, and he uses finances to do that. He does. He wants us to steward those, those resources, those very tangible resources. He wants to bless you. He does. He really does. God wants you to get rich. <laughs> Sorry that I have to sound like some prosperity preacher when I say that, but, but really, let, let's break the religious mindsets for a moment. God wants to give you wealth so that, so that you can not only provide for your family, but that you can provide for those in need, right? Right? He wants you to provide for the body of Christ. He wants you to provide for others in need. He wants to, he wants to expand. your. So this is all fruitfulness, right? This is, and this is a year of fruitfulness. It is. This is a year of fruitfulness for us. Real manifestation. As we hear and understand the word, Jesus said. So what I want to do this morning is talk about hearing and understanding the word. Like, Wow, we really, I, I want to know what that means. In light of fruitfulness, because we're all searching, the whole world is searching for the fruit of God, which is just an example of the promised land, the promises of God. We all want it, so wouldn't we want to know what Jesus means here, that those who hear 
and understand the word bear a hundredfold, sixtyfold fruit in their life. Right? That's, that's what I want. So I've been praying, Jesus, release Holy Spirit teaching on this. What is hearing and what is understanding? I want to talk about those two things. What those mean. First, I want to give a quick recap of where we've been as a body and the vision of this, of this church. Because I believe that that is so important for us. We need to have vision and we need to have hope. We need to know we're going somewhere. And for those of you that have been tracking with us, you've heard this a few times now, but I don't care. I, I just I want to continue to sow the vision in our hearts that we understand what God is saying to us. And this, this is something that, that I will be as bold to say, thus says the Lord. Because if you've tracked with us, you'll, you'll know the stories and the things that God has done and the way that he's confirmed this like so clearly that this is what he's calling us to in this season. He's made it. So clear, if you haven't heard it, if you're relatively new here, then let's set up a meeting and talk about it because I love to share this, what God is doing here and and to explain more of what what his plans are for this house. But we've been talking about uh, a three-year kind of journey and I'm not locked into specific dates and everything. I'm not big on just giving dates for stuff. But, But in general, the Lord is speaking about the next three years to us in a general way, explaining about us needing to raise up a house of glory, a house of redemption and a house of light for this region and extending beyond that region. So what God is calling us to in preparing for that latter house of glory is to build a cornerstone. Or really to uncover the cornerstone that's always been here, to to root out everything else and to start with the cornerstone. That's the first part of a building, right? The cornerstone. What is the cornerstone? It's the finished work of Jesus Christ. It's all about his work, what he did once and for all, for all. It's all about understanding what he has done. And so it takes the spotlight completely off of us. Completely off of our works and what we need to do to somehow earn God's favor or earn fruitfulness or earn love or earn whatever, more of God in your life. It's not about what you do, it's about what Jesus did. The altar is mostly about his sacrifice, it's not about your sacrifice, okay? It's about his altar, the altar of the cross where he poured out the fullness of the divine glory, the divine presence for all to receive freely. So we are in a year now, we talked about starting September of this, of, of this past September, this past fall, 2012, and it's taken a whole year to uncover, to root out all things that hinder understanding the finished work of Jesus, what he did, taking, taking our eyes off of ourselves and understanding what he has done in crucifying our sin, our evil, and setting us free. From there, we feel as though the Lord is saying to build a foundation. Year two is the foundation year. And that ties in with the cornerstone. It's a multiplication of the cornerstone. It's still Jesus Christ and him crucified, but it's a greater understanding of love, of love and family and spiritual fathering and spiritual mothering and being a family and being a voice of of wisdom and a voice of love to this generation and to the world around us and coming into that kind of love, coming into that through an understanding of Christ in you, through the natural overflow of Jesus and the gospel, just you getting so joyful, so high on God that you're just bursting out the seams with his love and you're beginning to walk in that love and extend that love in the family dynamic of God the family dynamic of of spiritual fathers, spiritual mothers, brothers and sisters begins to radiate more as a foundation for as God brings more people into this house and into our lives, that that foundation of love and that understanding that it's all about Jesus is set up clearly. You with me so far in this recap here? Okay, then the third year is where we begin to build the living stones of the temple, the stones. And who, who are the living stones? Yes, you're pointing to yourself there. Yep, yep, you too, Celine. Pointing, yep, every one of us, every one of you. The living stones is as you become alive to Jesus in you, you become alive to your true self. Everything you already are, everything you already are but has been covered by the voices of other people, the voices of this world, everything that hinders you from being truly yourself, truly free in Christ, your true self in him begins to shine and you begin to wreak havoc on darkness and we begin to advance the kingdom 
we begin to advance his message and we begin to really sow out into the harvest field, into the community like never before. So that's the vision that God has released to us over the next three years. And we believe that amazing, amazing stuff is just going to be popping, just going crazy here as we turn our hearts to Jesus Christ and him alone, as we allow his love and the Father's heart to become one with our heart, we are going to begin to advance and move forward like never before. So that's kind of the vision. That's where we've been at. And the reason I'm recapping this, one, is that it's a New Year's message kind of, so I think it's a little appropriate to talk about that for the new year. Um, But also because I need us to understand the urgency of this season, okay? The urgency of where we're at and understanding the cornerstone, the finished work, the word of the kingdom, and how significant it is. Because when I say build a cornerstone, I'm not talking about something in this physical building, right? I'm talking about you. I'm talking about a cornerstone in you. You, you, it's, It's the cornerstone of Christ in you being established. He's already there. You already have the fullness of God. You are in union with Jesus Christ. But it's you awakening to that, taking hold of that, And that beginning to become the cornerstone of us, the church. Okay, so this is so vital for us. And listen, I just, I said it before, 2012, it's like a, like a, like a a whisper. It's just like, it just went, came and went. How quick did 2012 go? I mean, really? (laughs) Really? I feel like yesterday we had Pat and Susan both here for the ordination when I was ordained. I mean, doesn't it feel like a few weeks ago? (laughs) Like some holidays happened in between, but somehow it was a few weeks ago. Um, Yeah, this year is going to be the same, probably faster. It's going to go. I'm going to be sitting here giving a 2014 word, (laughs) like tomorrow. And this year is going to be gone. It's going to go so fast. So I want us to take hold of this year. I want us to take hold of it like like never before. Just Paul says to redeem the time. Redeem the time. And I believe that redeeming the time and taking hold of this year, letting it be all that it's supposed to be, will come from hearing and understanding the word of the kingdom. So, first thing, first dynamic is hearing. Like, Lord, what, is, what does that mean to really hear? I ask this question because a lot of us can listen and sit in church and listen. But do we hear as Jesus is communicating? Are we hearing? Or are we just kind of listening? Kind of just somewhat hearing? What does it mean to really hear? This is a year where the root system of our life begins to be exposed. It begins to be exposed more and more clearly of where the seed has fallen in our life. And as we hear the word and receive the word... The measure of how we hear, the measure of how we understand determines the measure of fruitfulness. Okay? If our seed, the seed that's been sown into us, has fallen on thorny places, if there are thorny places and rocky places in our life, or there's a complete it's completely on the side of the road, like you don't even care, it's just on, you know, it's not even an issue, that's gonna become very evident this year. It's gonna become evident. And I felt like I needed to re-say that, that it will be evident. But God has a plan of making this a house of fruitfulness, a house of fruitfulness. And so if things, and they will for everybody, okay, everybody has a measure of it, different types of receiving the seed, If anybody has that exposed, the thorns or the rocky places in their life this year, it will become clear so that the light can extinguish it. It will be brought into the light 
so that God can transition you into a place of hearing and understanding the word, into a place of the good soil of your heart holding the word of the gospel. God does not want us to remain a people who hear the word, who get excited about it, who go to a small group once or twice and then fall away, or hear something and talk about it and express it to others and then all of a sudden we lose interest and get focused on the cares and worries of the world and we, and we miss out on what that word was wanting to release in our life. God wants to move us into a place of stability of faith. Stability of hearing and understanding the word, which we'll go into in a moment. But a place of really taking hold of the gospel where it's not just a nice thought. It's not just a nice Sunday message. It becomes the center of your heart. Okay, where your heart is determines where you invest, right? If your heart is in something, you invest in that something, whatever it is. And people's hearts are locked into all kinds of things. And you know what? God wants us to enjoy things in this world and passions and hobbies and all kinds of stuff. I personally, and I'm not, I'm not being wishy-washy grace here, I really think that there's been way too many angry preachers slapping people and guilting people, saying like, okay, you're... you're your heart's in all these wrong places and, and God just wants you to give up all your desires for baseball and sports and all your desire for, you know, for um, the gym and all these things, you know, and, and you, you need to put God first and all that stuff. All right, yeah, I can agree with that, but the spirit it's spoken out of is just total condemnation. And, um, and that's not at all what Jesus is wanting to say this morning, okay? Just want to make that clear. However, if... The soil of your heart, that is the place where the word impacts, where the word comes in. If the soil of your heart is crowded, if it is too crowded with other things, and those other things might not be physical, they might be lies and stuff that we believe and that we're holding on to, that word is just going to have a difficulty breaking forth and really settling in that soil. Is everybody with me? Still following? So to bring it back, I again want to talk about hearing and understanding. In this year of manifestation, this year of fruitfulness, again, God is committed to that. And so he will bring us into situations and things where the seed can either be fully exposed or where it can be transferred into the good soil of our heart. And I just need you to really listen to that. So this is a year where, I wrote this down, self-works, religion, in the negative sense, religion as in trying to earn or buy the favor of God, worry, unbelief, is about to be exposed and shaken like never before. There is a bulldozer of grace and glory coming through here. And everything that's just locking up us and fear and anxiety and, and distraction... It's just going to get pummeled. It's just going to get pummeled. And it's just going to leave behind the glory of God within you. The glory of God that's already there. But in order for that to come, we need to be hearing the word. We need to hear. So, you got Hurricane Sandy that came uh, a few months ago now, right? Um, Governor Christie gets on the TV tells everybody down the shore to evacuate, right? Different governors from different states in this area put out certain uh, evacuation procedures for um, particular cities and towns on the Jersey Shore and on the coast. All right. Most people listen to that evacuation, right? I have a friend that uh, her daughter um, will absolutely refused to evacuate at first, and was like, it's going to be fine. It's just going to be like, you know, the stuff we had last year. Hurricane Irene wasn't that bad. I mean, got some water, but, you know, we'll, we'll make it. And uh, finally, I mean, the, her, her mother had to plead with her to say, listen, you, you, need, you need to listen to it this time. Like, evacuate, right? Well, her house was obliterated <laughs> completely, completely obliterated. Um, 
She listened. She heard the word from Governor Christie. (laughs) She heard the word. But there were people that didn't hear, right? I mean, they might have listened, they might have heard, but they didn't hear. And they stayed, and the storm came, and, and many died. Many died. And didn't take it seriously. They might have seen it on the TV, but they weren't really hearing what he was saying. Weren't really getting the impact of it. Well, I don't say that to put like a fear focus on us. I I actually mean the opposite. That there's a hurricane of ridiculous glory (laughs) coming to the body of Christ. (laughs) There's a hurricane of just glory and wonder. (laughs) And joy. There is. A joy that's rooted in the kingdom of heaven. Not this realm. The kingdom of heaven. That's just going to explode in our hearts. And if that's the case, I want to be hearing. I want to be ready. I want to be positioned for that. I want to really be hearing that word and the importance of that. Because it's coming. (laughs) It's really coming. This is a year to wake up. Part of the reason we don't hear fully the gospel is because as I'm preaching to you right now, as you're in your seats... There is a whole bunch of other voices in your head from your life and your past that are also preaching at you on a subconscious level. And it's kind of a matter of who wins. That's why preachers need the anointing of God to break through that yoke. They, need, they can't just preach a nice sermon that they got out of a book. They need the Holy Spirit to bring revelation, to pummel that, the, the barrier in your mind. Right? We need Holy Spirit anointing on, on, on preachers. To do that. But that's the reality that, that we're preaching a word, but there's other voices also preaching. And a lot of us are listening and hypnotized by that other voices, and we're in slumber. You might be completely busy, but you're slumbering. You're asleep under this voice of you're a failure, or things aren't going to really work out for you. Not this time, they never have. Never will. Look at this. Look at A, B and C. I mean, they're great. They're, they're, they're like lawyers, right? These voices. They'll really point out all the the examples for you. They're good. Satan is the accuser. (laughs) Condemnation. Or voices of of stuff you might have received growing up in church or going through church over the years from many well-meaning, well-intentioned pastors and leaders who put works and burden on you that you need to somehow work for God's favor and love to work for the Holy Spirit. That, my friends, is called witchcraft. Witchcraft. That is you trying to work and attain the anointing of God. Jesus Christ's blood is the only thing that releases the anointing of God. Not your work, not your sweat and labor. God commands his people to rest. To rest. He says, thou shalt not do any work at all on the Sabbath. And what was the Sabbath? It was pointing to Jesus Christ. So we got got the voices of other preachers, well-intentioned, maybe preachers, prophets and apostles, people that might have a great ministry, might do a miracle here or there, but they're preaching not out of a concept of grace, out of a concept of works. Doesn't mean they're not anointed and they're not saved and all that kind of stuff, but they have a foundation that has crept into the church and the Dark Ages and the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant, Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostal Church. I mean, it's everywhere. It's this underlying theme of works and that you're still a sinner. That's the next voice. Voice telling you that this is who you are, you're still, a sl- you're still a sinner, you're still a slave. It's actually prideful to say that you're a saint. Don't ever say that. Are you kidding? That's the word of God. <laughs> That's what the word of God tells you. So there's other voices going on and God wants to shatter those voices this year. The Lord's going to break those voices this year. Because the truth is true no matter what those voices say. Can you say amen? amen. The, the truth is true no matter what those voices say. Right? I don't care how loud they are or how hard you feel like you have to fight them at night when you're trying to fall asleep. The truth is true whether they're yelling or quiet. And as we rise up into the truth, despite the voices, all of a sudden they, they, we, we see them for the little snakes that they are. And we start stepping on them. Like, oh, this isn't true. I've been intimidated by a voice. Some of us are still intimidated by little third graders that made fun of us on the playground. In some way, you don't realize it, doing some psychology on you right now. You're still intimidated by a little 
12-year-old with pimples making fun of you. Their voice is still gaining access over you. And so all of a sudden you find yourself like insecure out of nowhere. It's that book. God, listen, you are the righteousness of God. You are set free. You are set free from all of that. And the truth is true, (laughs) even whether you believe it or not. Truth is true, no matter what. So we're going to need to hear the word. And God is going to give us the grace to hear the word of the kingdom. As we go into it, as we go through this book, especially the first, I believe the first half of this year, almost like, you know, harvest season is in the fall, right? I almost feel like there's there's a natural progression, even this year, that that seed is just going to be sown like crazy in our hearts. And you're just going to see more and more blossoming as this year goes forward. So that's hearing. But it's not just hearing, it's understanding. Understanding the word. So what does understanding mean? This I had a little bit more of a hard time with. So I I was really studying this and really doing some more research into it, praying about it. And uh, I decided to look up that word, right? In the original Greek language, like what is the word that they're really, were writing here? What are they saying? Uh, So I looked it up and it's a word uh, called suniemi. Uh, It's actually S-Y-N-I-E-M-I, the transliterated version. It's really where we get the word synthesis from. Synthesis. And it has to do, actually, the, the picture that it communicates has to do with two rivers flowing together. And a union, a unity, understanding, a, a, an understanding, a unity coming together. So for us, what that's going to mean is us coming into agreement with the mind of Christ. Us coming into one in our thought pattern with the thought pattern of Jesus, Christ. Now, The simple definition, it's not actually simple at all, but the definition that the Greek lexicon gives, it talks about to put the perception with the thing perceived. To put the perception with the thing perceived. So let me break this down because this confused the heck out of me at first until I started thinking about it more. The perception and the thing perceived becoming as one. So how many know that we can look at something and perceive something And make a judgment and an assumption, but we're really not seeing reality. So your perception of something is different from what that thing actually is. That's what this is saying. To join the perception with the thing perceived. Okay? So you look at like, you know, some of us might look at a person who's like really cocky and prideful, right? And we get bothered by it. And we're like, oh, that person's so cocky. And so whatever. And then we get some understanding about that person's life. And we actually realize that there's maybe some insecurity there. Maybe there's some other stuff going on. Maybe some of it's just their natural personality and they really aren't that prideful. I mean, sometimes they are, but but let's just say this person really just has some insecurity, has some stuff going on. And all of a sudden, because you got understanding, it's a new picture. Your perception was completely wrong. You were making a judgment of a person without knowing their heart. So what you're perceiving needs to come in true with the reality of what is there, what is perceived, your perception, and what's perceived become one. All right? So to apply this to the gospel, we call this the renewing of the mind. Right? And the fact of the matter is, the Holy Spirit has to zap you with this. I mean, he really does have to bring revelation, and he wants to bring revelation. We need to be asking him to bring revelation to renew our minds to this, really renewing our minds to the fact that we already have the mind of Christ, just understanding what we already have, right? But there is a process in renewing the mind. There's there's a process where things just begin to click, where I can preach the same thing, or Jackie or James or somebody, uh, Robert Osti can come and preach the same thing over and over, and then all of a sudden it just starts to click because you're getting understanding, because your thoughts about it were, were might have been confused and disconnected. All of a sudden there begins to be a connection. You just begin to get it. So how many people here have started a new job at one point? Yeah. (laughs) And you start, and depending on the job, there's anxiety in the beginning. You're the new person. (laughs) And you feel like, am I ever going to learn all of this stuff? Again, depending on what it is. I've had to do that twice this year (laughs) with two jobs, this one and my work in the local high school. And it's overwhelming. It's like, am I ever going to get all this stuff? I got, you know, into the pastorate and I'm like, you know, weddings and funerals and preaching and, and church finances and, 
elder meetings. Thank God I have an amazing elder team. <laughs> but Jesus, it was a little overwhelming at first. It's like, am I ever going to get this? Like, like all, all these other dimensions of business and, and different things that come with it. Whatever the job is. Uh, a secretary, something, where you have to learn different stuff. It's overwhelming. But then there comes a point, all of a sudden, where things just begin to click, right? Where in your job, and all of a sudden, the new, new person comes, and you're like, awesome, like, I'm not the new person anymore. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. You feel it. You've gotten it. Glad I'm not the new person. And then you might even be training that new person, and it's like you're totally calm. You know what you're supposed to be doing. You got it. Because what happened? It just clicked. Over time, it just happens. Right? I mean... Hopefully you show up to work, <laughs> otherwise it wouldn't happen. But you just show up, you do what you're supposed to do, and things just click. Well, it's the same thing with hearing the word of the kingdom. You hear it preached, you go into it, hopefully it's the pure gospel and not some watered down works gospel. But you hear it preached, and all of a sudden things just begin to register. They just begin to come together, and you begin to get it in your heart. So this is a year where we are grabbing hold of this grace revolution, this grace awakening that's coming on the body of Christ. There is a grace revolution. I'm telling you, it's, it's been offensive. It's been offensive to some people out in the body, out in church realm, because it's just... They say it's too good to be true or, or that, you know, whatever. There's a million different arguments. I'm not going to get into it. But the grace revolution that is happening all across the world, it is releasing revolutionary concepts to us. Just stay with me another few minutes. It is, we are learning revolutionary concepts in the body of Christ. Things that, that haven't been hit on or haven't been, I should say, expounded on with revelation consistently over the years. And so this is a year where we begin to wrestle through and allow those revolutionary concepts to settle in the soil of our heart. I'll say two things about these revolutionary concepts that you've already heard us talk about. You've already heard um, Robert Dosti who came in and, and, and did the Awakening Conference and you'll be hearing in more depth as we go through the Happy Gospel together. But two things. One of these revolutionary concepts is the reality of what happened on the cross. That not only did Jesus die on the cross, but you were on the cross with him. You were co-crucified with Jesus. And you were co-resurrected with Jesus. Your issues, your, your problems, were on the cross with Jesus Christ. You and all of whatever anger and whatever depression or bipolar disorder you're going through was all there on the body of Jesus. All of the curse was on the body of Christ. Rage and malice, deceitfulness and lust. Paul says, it's been crucified. The old man has been put off, past tense, at the cross. And when Christ rose, the new man, the new you rose with him. And you're free. You're free. So that reality of your co-crucifixion with Jesus. Paul said, I was crucified with Christ. Past tense. An understanding. A waking up. Whoa, I am free. I am free. Jesus took that stuff. Letting, literally letting the dirt get over your head. Like you're in the grave. You're realizing like that stuff is in the grave with Jesus. When he rose, that stayed there. And you rose to new life. That is a revolutionary concept that needs to wash us clean. The second thing is the goodness of God. This revolution of grace is, is declaring the goodness of God to a whole new level. That Jesus Christ once and for all atoned for the sins of mankind. The sins of the whole world. That God is no longer counting men's sins against them, it says. So big news flash for all the big prophets and apostles out there. God is not judging America. He's not judging the sins of America. Whew. That's going to be a tough one to get through our heads. Sin has consequences. So stuff, bad stuff's going to happen if America 
is living in total rebellion. But they don't need preachers going out talking about the 20 harbingers of how much God hates you. They need preachers going out declaring the gospel of grace that where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. And that grace message will actually turn the tide of rebellion. (laughs) The grace of God. That God has done with punitive judgment. He's done. Punitive judgment is a form of judgment where you are punished for your sin. There is rehabilitative judgment. Where God releases his righteous judgments on the world to rehabilitate. To make us healthy and whole. And things get shaken up. But punitive judgment is gone at the cross. Jesus' blood satisfied the wrath of God forever. He says, I will no longer be angry with you. God is no longer angry at you. Whoo! Wow. That is going to get in and it's going to cause an explosion, a little wonderland of joy in this place. To hear and understand. It's the gospel. What does that word mean? Good news. Really? (laughs) Good news. It's the gospel. It's the good news of Jesus. It really made people happy back in the day. (laughs) It didn't get hold of by... by, by, uh, by pagan societies and by Rome and politics and all stuff that turned it into something else. <laughs> it was just a good news message. So that joy is just going to erupt. But this is a year that we take it seriously. We take the gospel seriously. We take it seriously. And by the way, seriousness and joy are not a contradiction, okay? Okay. Some of the most serious people in the kingdom are those that can't get off the floor because they're laughing so hard and so drunk on the Holy Spirit. We judge them, but you know what? Some of us judge them, but a lot of them are just so believing the word of God that they can't move. Really, I remember going to some of these conferences with people like Ben Dunn or some of his associates, and I was like, what the heck's going on? Like, people are just cracking up in the Holy Ghost, just laughing, like, so happy. It's like offensively happy. Imagine that, being offensive. Imagine being offensively loving. <sighs> well, let's be offensively joyful. <laughs> and, but I just realized, wait a minute, these, because I started to get drunk too. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I'm actually believing this stuff. Like this makes me really excited. I can't be normal. Like it makes me want to jump a little bit. Okay, so they, 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 they go together, right? When you take the gospel seriously, it begins to look like something in your life. <laughs> Okay, so I'll wrap this up. This is a year of fruitfulness. This is a year that we bear the fruit of the seed of God within us. And if we find little fruit this year, as we find maybe some stuff coming out that doesn't line up with the character of Jesus, it is going to be such a moment of opportunity for God to transition you into really taking this message seriously. (laughs) Taking the gospel seriously. ...to a whole new level in your heart... ...to the soil of your heart... ...whatever that looks like for you. We're not setting legalistic parameters... ...of what that means... ...and what that needs to look like. But you know... ...you know if your heart is engaging... ...with this message or not. You can can be honest with yourself... ...with that. And as you engage... ...as you engage with it... ...the fruit will come. And as you allow... ...your mind to stay clear of offense... ...too... This is it, I promise, I'm praying, okay? As you allow your mind to stay clear from the offense, we get offended at grace. The most offensive thing, the most difficult thing you'll have to deal with this year is the rest and the ease of the gospel. Hearing and understanding is so simple. It's just believing. It's just being like little kids and believing. But we so want to earn our merit badges and our crowns in heaven. Listen, whatever crowns you get in heaven, you're just giving them back to Jesus anyway. Because they were never yours to begin with. He did it all through you as you learned to rest in him. You cast the crowns at his feet. So give up your pursuit of crowns and start pursuing Jesus Christ. As you pursue him, crowns come. Crowns will come. But it's through rest. It's through an ease. So we're going to need to... Watch out for that offense and those angry theologians that don't like the ease of the gospel, the good news of the gospel, because they think it waters down all the sacrifice. Listen, exalt Jesus' sacrifice, and you will live the most fruitful, loving, sacrificial, joyful life you could imagine as the sacrifice of Jesus.
becomes centered in the throne of your heart. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for what you have this year for us, Lord. Thank you so much for the ease of the gospel, Lord, that it's a matter of just believing, (laughs) of really hearing, Lord, really understanding, sitting at your feet, Lord Jesus, and listening to your word. That was the good part. Not all the work and not all the thing that that Martha was doing, Lord, but, but little Mary sitting at your feet, listening to your word, just drinking it in, bothering her sister because she was too lazy (laughs) because she was just listening to the words of Jesus. Lord, make us just Mary's this year. Lord, make us a people that just listen, sit at your feet, and just drink in the gospel. Who take it seriously, Lord. Wow. Jesus.